The first two are quite lengthy. The other four aren't. So if we get to 25 class and I'm still on thing one, don't worry, we'll get there. So there's a lot to say. This passage is, there are lots of sermons tied up in this passage. And all I've got on the screen behind me is an image for each of my points. So the first one is this, not that I already have. So we're going to read Philippians chapter 3, and we're just going to read a couple of verses from verse 12, and it says this. Not that I already obtained this, or I'm already perfect. But I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Not that I have already attained this. What is the Apostle Paul referring to as he continues this letter to his dear friends in Philippi from his imprisonment in Rome? What is he saying that he's not already obtained? We have to look back into verses 12 to 16 just to get the answer. We're not going to read that. You can glance, glance at it, look, cast your eye over it. Paul talks of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. That's what he's referring to. The Apostle is talking about the wonder of his conversion and all that that means he has inherited through Christ. He says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He talks about the righteousness from God that depends on faith, and not on the law, which he had stuck to so passionately for many years. He talks about being like Jesus in his sufferings, in his death, and in his resurrection. He talks about knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. This morning, do you, do you know Christ Jesus as Lord? Do you know Christ Jesus as Lord this morning? Are you, this morning, found in him? If you are, does it move you to wonder and rejoicing that you are in Christ Jesus? Knowing Christ Jesus, that phrase highlights in this text the superiority of Paul's current position as a Christian compared to his former position as a Jew and all the privileges that came with that. So if you read back into chapter 3, he talks about all his status as a Jew and he says, I consider that all rubbish. And it's a worse word than that he uses in light of what I now possess because of what Jesus has done. Knowing Jesus outweighs everything that I had achieved and I have achieved a tremendous amount. What do we mean... What do I mean when I say to you, do you know Jesus this morning? I'll tell you what I don't mean. I don't mean knowing about him. I don't mean that you've read about this historical figure. <clears throat> I don't mean it's about coming to church. I don't mean it's about what your mum and dad believe. I don't mean it's about being a good person. It is vital. And if you take nothing else away from this morning, take this. It is vital that we each know Jesus personally. There's some verses in the Bible that say things like, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. 
Knowing Jesus is about believing in what he's done. Knowing Jesus is about walking with him on a daily basis. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. <clears throat> this is knowing Jesus this morning. I'll be really honest with you this morning, and I pray this regularly. <coughs> I pray often that I would know Jesus more intimately. That he would be like the friend that I call upon. He is the first place I go to when I'm excited, when I'm troubled, whatever's happening in life. Knowing Jesus is really, really personal. The Old Testament uses this word for describing a man and wife relationship. In Genesis 4, chapter verse 1, it says, Adam knew his wife. For those of you that know your scripture, there's a, that means something, and it is incredibly intimate. And that is the same word that is Paul uses for knowing Jesus. This is incredibly personal and intimate. It's not about the person next year. It's not about other members of your family. It is about your knowing <coughs> Jesus today. It's really, really important that you have that straight. Afterwards, if you want to come and talk to me about knowing Jesus, because it either appeals to you or you're confused, come and talk to me. I will find time, because it is the most important thing you can do today, this week, this year, in your life, is knowing Jesus. So, that's what Paul's referring to when he says, not that I have already obtained this. So let's move on a little bit. It's not that he has already obtained this, or as he says, that he is already perfect. But he is pressing on. He is striving for the finish, as an athlete does in the home straight of a race. Who are these two guys? Sebastian Coe. Sebastian Coe and Steve Obert. And who is the best? <laughs> well, they both had the moments, but when I was growing up, watching these two was fantastic. What distance did they use? They used to run the middle distance. It doesn't matter what distance you're running. This word that is used is for the pressing on, the striving, when you see the finish line. It's about the home straight. Philippians talks about the good work that started in you. In a way, it's easy to start being a Christian. <coughs> Continuing to be a Christian can be tough. This is about having... Rich, when you're doing the Ponty Park run, and you get to three kilometres and you're going up that hill, that's where it really matters, isn't it? It's not the start, it's that bit, it's not even the finish, because when you drop over the finish line, it's done. But that bit is a killer. And this is what we're talking about. We are talking about pressing on. The middle distance run runners that were doing 800 or 1500 metres, it's that last lap. It's when the finish line is in view, they are striving for the finish, they are pressing on. And this is what he's saying. That I'm not there yet. Faith in this life is an ongoing process. Do you ever look at other Christians and marvel at how good they are as followers of Jesus? And it makes you feel a little bit... The sacrifice and commitment, maybe some of the people that preach or that leave from the front. Can I just say with absolute confidence that every one of them is on the same journey? And if they are, they haven't made it yet either. God is working in them through his Holy Spirit and they pretty much feel the same struggles that you do. In fact, the existence of a tension or a struggle is a true feature of being a Christian. Don't give up. Don't doubt what God is doing. Paul says to the Galatians in chapter 5 and verse 17, For the flesh, our old nature, desires what is contrary to the Spirit, God's Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh, and they are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. And then it says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So it sounds like it's complete. It's not. It is an ongoing struggle. It is a battle. As long as you're alive on this earth, you're going to struggle with sin, because it corrupts everything. John Stott says, that this crucifixion, when we have to crucify the flesh, this is not done to us, but it is done by us. We have to do this ourselves. 
Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. It is what we do when saved. We repent of our old ways. And then he says this, and I love this. But remember, crucifixion is slow, it's painful, and it's always decisive. We are putting to death the old nature, but it's a slow process, it's a painful process, and it never fails. That's what we are being called to do. If you're a Christian today and you're struggling, take heart, because the Bible says it's a struggle. The old and the new are fighting. One last thing. We've crucified the old nature. It, the imagery is amazing. We've put it to death on the cross. Do not be tempted to go back and dabble with what you've nailed to the cross. <clears throat> Paul says, forgetting what lies behind. Do you think these two are thinking about what's going on in the race up to now? Are they thinking about what happened at 200 metres or 300 metres? <laughs> not at all. They've got one thing in mind. They're striving. You can see the striving. <clears throat> they are striving for the finish. So, Paul says, forget what lies behind, both the good and the bad, the great achievements, and the total failures of your life so far do not matter. He literally says this, grasp that thing for which Christ has grasped you. Grasp that thing which Christ has grasped you. What does that mean? In Ephesians, in chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has a plan for your life. Are you doing the works that he prepared beforehand? If you're a Christian, do you know God's plan for your life? Are you doing those things that he prepared? Or are you just like... Living life, hanging out, being chill, taking it easy. <clears throat> if you're a Christian, pray, get involved, there is lots to do. Talk to trusted Christians about how you can serve. If you want to come and talk to me afterwards, come and talk, and I will put you in touch with somebody within this fellowship that needs help in something that we're doing. There is so much to be done. We need help us. God's got a plan. He saved you for a purpose. Jesus grasped hold of you, and Paul says you've got to grasp hold of whatever it was that he grasped you to do. That's the emphasis of what he's saying. Are you in the race? Have you set off? Have you gone over the start line? There was apparently <coughs> a doctrine around Philippi that claimed that when you got saved, you suddenly were perfect. You're in and done. It's nothing, you know, I've become a Christian or I've put my faith in something, that's it, job done, I'm finished. Paul is probably opposing that view. He's telling you that this is a race that you have to work for. John Stock said, the work of sanctifying grace is progressive. It's an ongoing thing. But listen to this. Final perfection cannot be expected in this life. Only when we get to heaven, when we meet Jesus, we'll be made perfect. But relative perfection appropriate to our state as sanctified believers exists now. So that suggests to me that when you become a Christian, things change and your life or your reputation improves because the Spirit is living in you and changing you for good. So, we're not done, but we're definitely improved and improving. John Stott again he says this in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We don't know in any detail what we shall be in the last day, but we do know that we will be like Christ. There is really no need for us to know any more than this. We are being made perfect. One day we will be like Jesus. That is just, what a takeaway that is. This is incredible stuff. It's dynamite. If you reflect on that and you think about your day and your week, you are on a journey being made like Christ Jesus. There are lots of verses in the New Testament that tell us that this is not finished, that we are being matured, we're being refined, we're being made better. We're in a race that we need to grow up, that we need to move from milk to food. The Christian life is a journey of development. So, 
near the end of my first point, and it is 20 past. Okay. Firstly, very importantly, are you in the race? Do you know Jesus Christ as Lord? Secondly, wherever you are in the race, however <coughs> it feels, press on. It will be worth it. God has got a plan. Next slide, please. Right, in verse 17, he says this. We'll read another section. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, their minds set on <coughs> earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. The whole letter, everything that Paul says, hangs on the central example of Jesus Christ, the verses that we read. But Paul now boldly states that the Philippians should imitate him as he is imitating Christ. Christ. He sees his life being lived out as a picture <coughs> of Christ. That is a bold thing for a preacher to do. But it's what Paul says. If you want to know how to behave as a Christian, look at what I'm trying to do. Not me, that Paul. The big Paul. So my question is, who are your role models? Who do you admire? Because if you admire someone, you, whether you like it or not, will try to be like them. You will mimic them. Similarly, who are you a role model to? Because people are watching. And the little things that you do and say and even think matter. And people see it. And if they're following you, they'll copy it. Paul talks about a group of people that he names the enemies of the cross. Back then there, were, there was, there was a, a culture called the Gnostics that believed that salvation could be achieved through knowledge and not through faith. The Gnostics believed that the material world was created, but they viewed the creator divinity as imperfect. So Paul is having a kickback against the Gnostics to say, that's not the way it is, it's only by faith. Knowledge will not get you out of the mess that you're in. David Wells, a modern commentator, says that many today worship the God within rather than the God without. They worship the God, little g, within, rather than the big G, God, without. Is that true? People worship the God within, rather than the God without. But we, what, these verses are fantastic. This is, this is my takeaway verse for Philippians. <coughs> Paul is writing to a colony of Rome. Philippi is, it's, it's a mini Rome. The Romans have Pastored their culture all over it, and a church is started. And it's tough because the Romans just not seven bells out of them. They don't want Christians in there on their patch. Paul says this, but our citizenship is in heaven. <coughs> and to cut sight this morning, we are a colony of heaven. We are a colony of heaven. What a fantastic thought. Do you ever feel like you don't really belong? You don't. That's the simple truth. Jim Reeves sang a song, and it says this. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My tre treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And it goes on. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friends like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? My Saviour pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I have a loving saviour up in glory land. I don't expect to stop until I with him <coughs> stand. I remember that because somebody used to play it when I was little, and it stuck with me. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it, get this, it gets better, and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his 
glorious body. We could talk about what the Jesus... What, I thought often, what is the Lord Jesus Christ's body like? Will we have a body that walks on water, that walks through walls? It will be hungry because he ate. I don't know. But we will have the body like his glorious body. I can't wait because my body is getting old and it's a bit big. <coughs> It'll be just so fantastic. Next slide, please. Right. Chapter 4, verse 2 says this. I plead <coughs> with Theodia and I plead with Sinchi to be of the same mind in the Lord. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Sinchi to be of the same, in the same mind of the Lord. Paul says to them, I want you to agree. And we'll leave it at that. So we're human. And we immediately think, well, who are these people? What have they done? What's been going on? We don't know. We will probably find out in heaven, but not before. But this is the point. I need you to find a way to agree. We're told these are two women. Back in the day of Paul, there were influential women in the church. Noted. Things haven't changed, have they? Women are an influence. These two women had fallen out. And it wasn't just for them. It was for the whole congregation that Paul wanted agreement. And for him, because they reflected on his reputation. And for Christ. Because you are Christ's representatives. And in church, if you do not agree, it reflects on Christ. Paul says to them, find a way to agree. And he tells the church, help them to find a way to agree. And get this sorted out. He starts, actually, the verse before he says this. Verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. And then he says, I want you to agree. He's telling there are his students, there are his followers, there is reputation, it's important. Paul pleads with them to find common ground, but also makes it the church's or fellowship's business to help them find peace, to support them in coming together and finding common ground in their following of Jesus. These things matter to Paul and to God. Someone has said, there is much more that unites us than divides us. And that is so true of church. We must look to the things that we have in common, that God has blessed us with, rather than disagree over trivial matters here and now. What I find quite sad. I believe this is the only mention of Yodia and Sinchi in Scripture. If someone was writing your life story, what would you be remembered for? Next slide, please. First of all, rejoice in the Lord <coughs> always. I say it again, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Rejoice. Joy is not dependent on material things, or on current circumstances. Joy is not dependent on material things or current circumstances, but in the fact that we are loved by a God who controls everything and ultimately has the best intentions for us. Therefore, rejoice. <coughs> this is why we are able to not be anxious and no peace. And the verse actually says that the peace of God will stand on guard over your hearts and minds. The peace of God will stand on guard over your hearts and minds. I tread carefully because I know what it is to be anxious and I know that there's times when I just wish that I could control that. I pray that God will remove that 
and it takes time. It's hard. So if you're an anxious person, I say these words to you carefully. But God is greater. Phil mentioned to us, God's power enables people to overcome addiction. God's power, I believe, enables people to overcome anxiety. I also believe that if there is help that can be obtained in whatever source, then try that because these things can be really tough. Again, if you want to talk to me about being anxious, I'm all yours afterwards. Um, come and have a word. There's a lovely verse in there. It says, let your gentleness. I think the uh, NIV probably says something different. Is it? What's the word in verse 5? Let your reasonableness. Gentleness. 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 Reasonableness. Okay, so this word, it can be gentleness or reasonableness. It means this. This is the <coughs> essence of it. It means meet a man halfway. Meet a man halfway. Be reasonable. So often, I'm like this. We demand justice. This goes beyond justice if you think that's possible. I very much get upset by things that I feel are unjust. And I insist on justice. But actually, what I need is mercy. Jonah was a man in the Old Testament who got so angry with God because he knew he was a merciful God. He knew that he was going to send him to the Ninevites and that he'd be merciful to him. And Jonah says, I knew you'd do this. And in the book of Jonah, the only person that doesn't recognise God for who he is, is Jonah. Even the animals in Nineveh did what they were told to do. The worm and the plant, Jonah, was the, he stands out as being the one that couldn't see God for who he was. Meet a man halfway. Go beyond justice. Find a right solution. The world of today praises people who are hard-nosed and can get their own way. Paul says, show gentleness and then take your issues to God, everything, and leave it with God. The wrongs that are done to you, the failings and all the other stuff, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will stand guard on your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Two, two pictures to go. Next one please. Verse 8 says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Paul says, set your mind. Your mind, I promise you this, your mind will wander on all sorts of things. Who's got a phone? Where do you start off? <coughs> and where do you end up? Your mind is a machine that's just inquisitive and it will wander and you will end up looking at some things that are just a waste of time and some things that are actually really damaging. Paul says, choose the good stuff and set your mind. This is a discipline. Your mind will always be occupied with something, so you must determine what it's focused on, and that requires discipline. Trust, honour, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellence, anything worthy of praise. Think about these things. It's another sermon for all those. We're going to move on. Last slide. A new hope. Who's a Star Wars fan? A new ha what happened to the Empire in Star Wars? We're going to talk about it. In verse 21, so we've missed a big chunk out, but that's, I'm already over time. It says this, verse 21, Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings. Especially those who belong <coughs> to Caesar's household. Now the first bit of that verse is pretty standard text. It's the way that Paul would send his greeting. But this is unique. He says especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Why has he said that? Philippi is a colony of Rome. Rome is the empire. They're opposed to Christianity. Christians are dying in horrific circumstances because of the Roman Empire. Caesar's household doesn't mean Caesar and his mates. It means 
the administration of the empire. Paul is in prison and he's alongside Roman guards and he's taking every opportunity to tell them about Jesus. And the word is spreading. As the shift changes, the next one gets it. And he's doing an amazing job. Other people are seeing conversion within the administration of the Roman Empire. From a small part, from a small start, the corruption of the Roman Empire, at whose hands the Christians suffered terribly, was underway. And in 300 years, Christianity would be the religion of the empire and part of its undoing. you get that? 300 years after this, Christianity was the religion of the Roman Empire. The so-called Edict of Milan pro provided for this. It marks the Roman Empire's final abandonment of the policies of persecution of Christians. The age of the martyrs was at an end. The transition to the so-called era of the Christian Empire had begun. So what are these pictures about? Well, I'll tell you. So this is, I took these photos. This is in Rome, it's just close to the Colosseum. This is called the Arch of Titus. And when you look on the inside wall, just here, you see this. And Titus was the emperor that sacked Jerusalem. And what do you see? You see the golden, the golden ware from the temple being carried away from Jerusalem. Titus sacked Jerusalem. So that's the Arch of Titus. And around the corner is the Arch of Constantine. Emperor Constantine was the emperor that said Christianity is okay, we can do that. And in fact, became a Christian. Fascinating that this really exists. And in, when you go to Rome, they talk about all this, and it just you just think, wow, this is real. Paul is able to close. And it fascinates me that probably the last words he ever was able to say to his friends in Philippi is this: the grace. Of the Lord of our of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Amen. So to go back to just very briefly, to go back to the beginning. Now, not that I have already. Imitate me. Agree. Rejoice. Set your mind on these things. And even the mighty Roman Empire offered a new hope. Because God is great. Let's thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this letter to the Philippians. We thank you for the Apostle Paul. We thank you for this point in history when you changed the world. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his influence over everything. And as we look around the world and we just can't fathom how things are going to get better... We thank you that during the Roman Empire you found a way. And we trust you to find a way today. We pray that you'll make us faithful. Father, ask us, help us to lean on your Holy Spirit, to shape our lives, to be disciplined in what we set our minds on. Help us as Christians to agree, to find a way to agree more than anything else, to put aside the things that we think are important, and just to agree. Father, we pray that as doing that, that this will be good for your reputation and that people will want to know more about the Lord Jesus. We thank you that people are coming in and are inquiring and we pray that you'll help them. Father, for anybody that is suffering with anxiety or addiction, then we just ask that you will help them find the right help, but we pray that you too will be their help and we thank you that you can do miraculous things. So go with us, bless us, we thank you for these studies and we ask that there'll be a real benefit to us. Help us to be disciplined in our living, to strive for the finish line, and all because of the example of our wonderful Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.